Hi, so here, here we are again, Connect Season 4. This is the second study. And tonight we're looking at the second part of Colossians chapter 1. Last week we looked at a new vision of you, or in the last study we looked at a new vision of you. In this one we're talking about focusing our vision. And in these scriptures from Colossians 1.15 onwards, Paul, is, Paul sets out his vision of Jesus. He talks about Jesus and he gives us, he gives us 10 things, he lists 10 things that are characteristic of Jesus. Now you might wonder why Paul uh, felt that he had to do that, um, particularly to Christians, because obviously these people had heard the gospel, um, they knew about Jesus, um, he was at work through his spirit in their lives, and they were filled with faith and love, as, as we saw last time. Um, their hope was in heaven, and they uh, were growing, they were fruitful, and there was all sorts of good things happening in this, this particular church. So why would Paul talk about Jesus and list all these different characteristics of Jesus? Because um, he really sets out this very, very grand vision of Jesus. Well, part of the answer to that might be or might lie in the fact that um, Colossae as a city uh, was a city where there were all sorts of religious ideas floating around. And one was that, uh, that the Archangel Michael was an angel who was worthy of worship. Um, that might be why Paul talks a little bit about angels in his letter to the Colossians. So what Paul is really doing here, he's He's saying, guys, you need to understand that Jesus isn't just another God amongst a whole load of gods. He's not just another option in a very religious world. He, he, Paul wants to say to these people that Jesus is totally unique. Um, there is no one like him. Um, he is far above every other principality and power. He's totally different to all these so-called gods that people in this particular city are worshiping. So what does Paul tell us about Jesus? Uh, I want to suggest that there are 10 things that he says about Jesus. First of all, he says that Jesus is the image of God. He's the image of the invisible God. In the ancient world, uh, the, uh, the image of a god was, was thought to carry the presence of the god. Um, so sometimes in parts of the Roman Empire you would find statues of the emperor who believed himself to be a god. And the idea was that if the statue was there, if the image was there, the presence of that particular god uh, was there with the image or was contained in the image. And what Paul's saying here is, he's saying that Jesus is the image of God. It doesn't mean that he's uh, something different to God. He's saying that Jesus carries the very presence of God. Um, these people would have uh, seen images every day. They lived in a world that was filled with different images. Um, and, and none of those images carried the presence of any God, but he's saying, Jesus, he's the real deal. He, he carries the presence of God. So when we see Jesus, we see God. Then he, he says that Jesus is the creator of all things. Um, he's echoing the words of the Apostle John in John chapter 1, when John says that uh, it was through the word of God, the Son of God, and that the world came into being. So Paul says Jesus is the creator of all things. Then he says that he's eternal. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Um, Jesus predates everything. Um, and Jesus said of himself, he says, before Abraham was, I am. In other words, Jesus is eternal. He has always been here. He will always be here. Um, he is the eternal Son of God. Jesus didn't just come into existence when he was born in a manger in Galilee. The Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, didn't just come into existence uh, when he came into the world. 
he was uh, the Son of God with the Father long before uh, the birth of, of Christ in Bethlehem. He has always been the Son of God. So Paul says he is the eternal Son of God. Then he says that um, in him all things hold together. He holds everything together. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says that, that Jesus upholds all things by his powerful word. The reason this world hangs together, the reason it holds together is because Jesus holds it together. Then, uh, fifthly, he says that Jesus is the head of the church. He is the head of the body, the church. And it should be obvious to us that, um, that Jesus is the head of the church. It's not one person. It's not um, a ma any man or any woman. Um, it's not the pastor of the church, it's not the elders of a church, it's not a bishop, it's not an arch, it's, it's none of those people. The head of the church is Jesus. Um, he is the one who leads his church. Um, he's also uh, the resurrected Christ. He's the firstborn from the dead. Um, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, Paul says. Uh, if when he says, Paul uses the term firstborn, it's not like he's saying Jesus was born first. Um, the term firstborn is a, a term that, uh, that denotes or that refers to uh, Jesus' preeminence. If someone was uh, called a firstborn, it wasn't uh, to indicate that they were born first. It was to indicate that they were the uh, top person, if you like. So he's the firstborn from among the dead. That also indicates that um, not only did Jesus rise from the dead, but that he's the first of many who will rise from the dead because uh, when this life is done and, and we have died, when the Lord returns, we will rise from the dead and we will take part in his resurrection. Then he says that Jesus is supreme. He says so that in everything he might have the supremacy and then he says that he's fully God he was pleased to have all the fullness of God dwell in him um, let's take that first one first that he, 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 he that he might have the supremacy he is supreme um, I don't know how the Colossians felt about the world that they lived in um, it might have been a, a, a difficult place or it might have been a difficult time for them to live uh, it might have been difficult for them to get their, their minds around the idea that um, Jesus wasn't just another God. But Paul states here very, very clearly that Jesus is supreme, that he's fully God. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Um, again, this term fullness um, was one that was used by some of the, the mystical religions in the ancient world. And it's like Paul saying, you know what, some people think they have fullness when they go and worship their idol or they get involved in some of these mystery religions. I want you guys to know that Jesus is the real deal. If you really want fullness, if you really, if you want the real thing, Jesus is the one who brings us into true life. And then he says he will, um, he reconciles all things to himself. He'll reconcile all creation to God. And he says that he made peace through his blood shed on the cross and Jesus aim was not just to redeem us individually he wants to bring the whole creation back to God when Jesus returns he will bring about a new heaven and a new earth and that's part of the hope that we have as Christians and Paul says he's a peacemaker that uh, he has reconciled us he's made peace through his blood shed on the cross we have peace with God because of what Jesus has done for us. So there's 10 things that Paul says about Jesus and 10 things that um, I, I believe are, are very, very important to us in our world, just as important to us in our world as they were for the Colossians in their world. And then Paul talks about what I suppose you could say is God's vision for us. And you could sum this up as by saying that God wants us to enjoy his presence. Listen to what Paul says. He says that 
Um, we were alienated from God, but God reconciled us through the death of Christ to present us holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Um, that was why Jesus died. He, he wanted uh, to present you holy in God's sight, without blemish and free from accusation. That's a, an amazing thing when you think of it, that because of what Christ has done, we are without blemish. Now, um, I don't know what, if you know what a blemish is. I think most of us probably do, but it's like a stain. Um, and Jesus came so that every stain in our character, every stain in our soul, every stain in our hearts would be removed. And because of his blood shed on the cross of Calvary, you and I are free from every blemish. We're without blemish and we are free from accusation. And because of what Jesus has done, Satan no longer has the right to accuse us. Revelation chapter 12 talks about how the accuser accuses God's people day and night. And then verse 10 it talks about how God's people overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. We are able to stand confidently in God's presence because of what Jesus has done for us. And how does that happen? And Paul says, he says, you're able to do that you know, if you remain firm in your faith. If you continue in your faith, established and firm. That's how we continue to enjoy God's presence, by standing in our faith. What does it mean to establish in our faith steadfast and firm? It simply means this, that we keep relying on what Jesus has done. We don't look to ourselves, we don't look to our own works, we don't look to what we have accomplished or achieved, how much we read the Bible, how much we pray, any of those things. We simply lean into what Christ did for us on the cross almost 2,000 years ago. So there we have it, um, focusing our vision. I pray that as you do this study and that you'll begin to see Jesus in a whole new light. You'll see how magnificent he is, how wonderful he is, how great he is. And you will begin to see that God's plan for you was that through what Jesus did on the cross, you might be able to enjoy his presence and that you might be able to confidently come into his presence and enjoy relationship with him.